Well, praise the Lord and take this occasion on uh, Christmas Day to uh, wish you a very Merry Christmas, joyful Christmas and a be- very blessed New Year. Well, praise the Lord. I don't exactly have a Christmas message, but rather an aspect of our glorious Lord, one of his virtues, one aspect of his character. And uh, in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, he is called faithful, where we spoke on faithfulness uh, last week, but also and true, Revelation 19, 11. And I want to speak on this aspect of being true, aspect of being true. And, uh, you know, so often this thought, this virtue of true, links in with an arrow, that an arrow is true, is straight, and it hits the mark. And I want to tell a little story about one of the most famous archers of all time. And it was in the year 1307, in the town of Ortdorf, which means old village, in Switzerland, in the canton of Uri. And at that time, the Habsburgs, the Austrian uh, family, ruled all that area. And they became, uh, I think, increasingly proud and dominant And they almost went on the same path as Nebuchadnezzar. And they ordained that there be a pole set up in these various villages. And on the pole would be a Habsburg. It was a distinct hat, a Habsburg hat. And at the sound of the trumpet, everybody must take off their hats and bowed towards this pole. Well, it's very much like Nebuchadnezzar, where when all the trumpets sounded, they had to bow before his image. But here it was, a simple hat. Well, they did so, and, and if they didn't, they would be put to death. Well... At a given moment, the trumpet sounded and everybody doffed their hat with the exception of one person by the name of William Tell. And uh, he was brought before the bailiff or the governor, Gessler, of the uh, Austrian Empire. And uh, Gessler said, look, if you don't bow before that uh, hat, then... uh, you're going to be put to death. And he refused. And then Gessler said this, all right, you put your son over there and put an apple on his head and then walk off 120 paces and then take your bow, take your arrow, and you have to shoot at the target of the apple upon your son's head. And if you succeed in splitting the apple, then you will go free. If not, both of you will die. Well, William Tell paced off the 120 so paces. And he took aim and he fired the arrow at the apple on his son's head and he split it. And Gessler said, all right, you can go free. But he said, I have a question. Well, what is the question? He said, what was the other, other arrow doing in your coat? Oh, he said, If I had killed my son, he said, the next arrow was going to be aimed at you and I would not miss. 
Well, the, the governor was furious, and so he took him down to uh, the boat in Lucerne Lake, and he said, we're going to take you to a castle and you'll never see sun and moon again in your life. Well, they started out. And Lake Lucerne's very treacherous. And so what happened? Well, the waves were so big that the other members in the uh, boat were very afraid. And they realized only the strength of William Tell could bring that boat to shore. So they took off his bondages, handed him over to the oar, and he got the boat to the shore. And then he jumped off and he kicked the boat and sent it back into the lake. Well, it was a very treacherous path, but he climbed up that path and went about... 20 miles and he came to a clearing and he was very sure that Gessler would get back and that he would come hunting him and so he hid behind a tree waiting for Gessler to come and sure enough Gessler came and he took the second arrow and he aimed at Gessler and killed him Well, after that, he went back to his town and went into a meadow. And there, with other like-minded men, he made a covenant (coughs) to defend one each other. And that is the formation of the Swiss nation as it is today. And they all look back to that time of William Tell. But that arrow that he shot had to be true. It had to be a polished shaft that we understand from uh, Isaiah 49. And it depicts the Lord Jesus. And perhaps we could just refresh our mind by turning to Isaiah 49. And uh, look at how the prophet describes pictorially the uh, Lord Jesus. And uh, it says this, uh, Listen, O isles unto me, uh, Isaiah 49, And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft in his quiver hath he hid me. And there we have the aspect of an arrow. First of all, there's a little flint. And uh, it's very interesting, uh, as you study the word of God, that in Isaiah chapter 50, it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ as his face. I'm in uh, Isaiah 50 verse 7. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be confounded. Therefore I will set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. In other words, the Lord came into this life with a determination to hit the mark just as William Till did with uh, his arrow and uh, split the apple. But uh, looking at uh, Isaiah 49, first of all, he made my mouth as a sharp sword. And uh, sharp sword speaks in Ephesians chapter 6 as the word of God. And that was the first thing that God did with his beloved son. He filled him with the word of God. So when he spoke, we are told in Psalm 45 that they were like 
arrows that came forth from his mouth and struck his enemies. And so there we have the thought that this flint, this sharp sword, is the word of God in our mouths too because we have to be like arrows in the hand of God that he can send them into the hearts of his enemies he can send them where'er he will but you see it's not just that flint from his mouth but a polished shaft and in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 we're told he learned obedience by the things he suffered and therefore you see an arrow does not just appear it has to be made that shaft is the all important thing because it's made of wood it speaks of humanity of Christ it speaks of our humanity and it has to be polished and uh, this is very important indeed because you see when that arrow flies through the air to hit the mark for which the archer intends you know there must be no ridges there must be no little knolls in that arrow because if so the aerodynamical pressure as that arrow goes through the air will deflect it and that has been my sorrow over the years to see so many they have been aimed at a mark but they have been deflected because their humanity was not polished it was not shall I say under obedience to the spirit of God and so many have turned aside all oh, the people that I've met who have said well yes I was once called to the ministry but after a time they gave up and uh, in particular I'm thinking one person unfortunately he was also a student here in years gone by and uh, he went to the mission field but uh, because he wasn't polished he got deflected and then uh, after some time he said to me you know I feel so free now I no longer have a call to the mission field in other words he was going to be an arrow that missed the mark. So it is very important indeed to understand why, you know, Jesus is called true. And I think there's uh, quite a lot of, uh, what shall I say, uh, scripture concerning Christ being true. But um, I just wanted to pick one out in Matthew chapter 22 verse 16 it was uh, the testimony of his enemies actually Matthew chapter 22 and verse 16 and here he is amongst the scribes and Pharisees and uh, in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 16, we find that the Pharisees took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they uh, sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Master, we know that thou art true. Now what a wonderful testimony that is. If we could have the same testimony of those surrounding us, those perhaps who are unbelievers, and they say, well, we know you are true. In other words, what you say is going to be right. And teach us the way of God in truth. 
Now, isn't that a beautiful testimony? Teaches the way of God in truth. A true person. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. And then they tried to entrap him after giving him that wonderful testimony. But that's the kind of testimony that we want, that we are true. And uh, you say, well, what exactly is being true? Well, I have, of course, been with many people over my life. And they have had the truth. And they have preached the truth. And they have seen signs and wonders with the laying on of their hands. But you know, for all that, they were not true people. In other words, they were not people whose desire was to hit the mark and keep the course. To them, you know, preaching, well, that was one thing. But they were not true. You could not trust them. And I'm reminded of uh, John chapter 2 where, you know, the people came to Jesus, you know, and followed him because of his miracles. But he did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in man. And you know, I've been in that situation where I've been surrounded by people who know the truth, preach the truth, and yet I knew were not true. Regretfully, it came to pass. They were deflected. They were deflected from the pathway. So you see, in this short homily, uh, because of the time, uh, we want to get you home to your kitchens and uh, that nice food that you're going to have. Uh, but I want to emphasize this thing, being true. Are you a true man? Are you a true woman? In other words, is there any alloy in your life? You know, we have the word sincere, which means sin without seri, which means wax. In other words, holding a vessel up which had cracked, they used to put a little wax in to hide the floor. Well, we don't want floors in our life. We want to be true, true, true. And, uh, you know, there's a key. I think that what one desires, one gets. And uh, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul, after speaking on peace, then gives us an admonition what we should think on. And he said, whatsoever things are true, if you meditate on that which is true, if you think of that story of William Till, the arrow was true, it hit the mark, and it was going to cost the life of his son if it didn't. But it was a true arrow. It had been polished. And you see, there's one other thing that we have not considered in Isaiah 49. That was in his quiver he hid me. You know, so often, and it was true with the Lord Jesus, that he was ready before the time. And you may have waited many years to be used by God, but you see, you're in his quiver, in his quiver. And you have to wait the moment when he's going to bring you out of the quiver. And I'm in that situation. <laughs> I've been in that situation for several years, waiting for God to bring me out, waiting for God, you know, to put me in his bow, to fire me, to hit the mark of the finality of his purpose for my life. I've had to wait. I've had to wait in a bed of sickness, a bed of pain, 
And, uh, oh, I must say, I cried with pain at times. But uh, I'm just waiting. I cannot pull myself out. An arrow cannot pull itself out of a quiver. We cannot put ourselves in the bow of God. It is the hand of God alone that will do it. But what is our duty? Our duty is to submit. First of all, to study the word of God. Somebody asked Sister Suzette uh, a while ago, what is the counsel you would give me to do during my time in Bible school? And essentially we were saying this, it's the finest time in a person's life where they can study and assimilate God's word. Because ever after that, they're going to have other things to do and they will not have the undivided time that's afforded here. And so it's very important to have that, shall I say, sword in one's mouth, the head of the arrow in one's mouth. And then you see, I think, of this polished shaft. My wife was in the hospital. And, uh, you know, most nurses are very sweet. But there are the dominating empresses in the hospital who feel that they, uh, you know, can give orders and... They pull you up and push you down. And my wife had one of these. And uh, it was very, very painful. She, she had all kinds of surgeries. And what she needed was a gentle nurse. Instead, she had a, or well, anything but a gentle nurse. Like a, a bull. I suppose a cow because she was feminine. But anyway, there it was. And she just pulled her up, put her down. And I said, oh, please. And then, myself, I've been contemplating some of the nurses I've had. Some are beautiful. They are very gentle. But some, you know, really upset me. And I'm thinking, well, could I get them changed? And Suzette said, oh, you can get them changed. But then I'm thinking, are they doing me a lot of good? Are they the final sandpaper that's necessary for this shaft of mine to be polished? You see, you have to look at every circumstance in life that God uses people and circumstances that we might find very aggravating and we might find that we want to run from them but they are so important the little irritants of life are in actuality God's blessings and they help to polish us and so you see we must look at things from the aspect of God here is someone who upsets me you know I'm thinking of a certain nurse upsets me and uh, I'm saying to Suzette look I can't stand this any longer she said well you can get a change if you want to but then I'm thinking did God ordain that she be there to irritate me to polish me and I've decided yes so I have to pray a little bit harder before she comes but there we are see of Jesus it was said he was true it says also every aspect of him in John chapter 1 and verse 9 he is the true light He is the true light. And uh, 
in, I think it's 728 of John. God is true. He won't let you down. When he speaks, he'll do what he says. And so that is the message I want you to take as you go into the new year. Yes, faithful last week, but true, true. People know that what you say, what you do, is the truth, and you are true. You won't turn from the course. You'll be like that arrow who struck the apple on that boy's head. No, you'll be true. You'll be true. And there's something, you know, well, at the beginning of Hebron here, I thought, oh, at long last, I'm going to have people who are going to flow with me. I'm not going to have problems. And lo and behold, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of them deserted me. And yet I knew it before it happened because I could feel they were not true. Oh, they had the message, but they were not true. And if you could meditate upon that, you see, it's not just having the truth, but are you true? Are you true? Are you true? And may God grant that each one of us, you know, can be on a white horse, as it says in Revelation 19, be amongst the armies of heaven following our leader, the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, who is called faithful and true, and that we are true. True, true, true. True, true, true. And somehow that rings throughout our life, throughout our body, throughout our speech, throughout our actions, we are true men and women of God and we will be true to the end and we will hit the mark of the apple of God. Amen. And so I want to wish you a very blessed uh, Christmas day. wish you a blessed week the last week of this year may it finish gloriously for you and triumphantly and as you look back you know to check have I done all that God wanted me to do this year so that we can say well I'm ready for the new year the old one has been fulfilled. Oh, be true. This, this word true is ringing through my heart that we be true, true, true men and women. Amen. And people can count on us. Well, God bless you.